All right, we on? We're good? All right, well, good morning. Happy 4th of July. Uh, just want to thank you for joining us again this week. We look like we got some on the road and, and some that are on the road with us. So if you're visiting with us, we're, we're glad that, uh, that you are with us. Uh, what we're talking about um, is in this class is kingdom, building kingdom character, um, how to take the uh, character of God or the attributes of God, how to apply them to our lives. And, and we'll talk uh, some about the one that, uh, that's been given to me this morning. Uh, but first, would you bow with me as we open with a word of prayer? Almighty God, thank you so much for uh, this first day of the week and um, this being the first day of the week and July 4th. And, and uh, thank you so much for this land in which we live and, and the uh, freedoms that we have and one of those freedoms, the freedom to worship you and uh, worship you freely. We're thankful for uh, you and in, in sending your son to die on the cross for us to free us from our sins to uh, hope of uh, eternal life with you. Lord, we uh, ask this morning as we open your word and we look at uh, how to build a kingdom character that you would help us to be, um, as we're gonna talk about this morning, an honest people and how to continually work on um, our character in regards to, to being honest. Lord, we, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we pray that, uh, again, as we open your word this morning, that we learn much. It's these things we pray in your son's name. Amen. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Job chapter 38, and you can get that part out of the way and be ready for when we get there. Um, Drew has really done a phenomenal job in, in, ta in tackling some of these uh, topics that, that he's gone through and, uh, and, and how to build our character to match that of our Father. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, the class. My job this morning is just to fill in, not send you running for the hills. And I was joking with Mr. Conley that as the substitute teacher, if I botch it, Drew takes all the blame. So don't come at me. Um, and he knows that as a, as a formal, former principal, we were talking about that. But, you know, as unattainable, I, I think, as it seems sometimes to really reach and, and grab hold of some of these characteristics of God, um, I, 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 it just is hard. And, and I think that each topic that Drew has talked about each week, uh, more and more I, I feel myself challenged by the fact that, man, that's really hard. And we're going to talk some about that in just a minute. But I, th I think that we got to understand that with these, that, that we really can't be a people that's in one ear and out the other, that we have to truly desire to be like our Father in order for these things to take place and take shape and take hold of our lives and us build some change. So this morning, we're going to talk about how hard this one is this morning. We're going to talk about how to add it to our character. We're going to talk about how Jesus did it. We're going to talk about how to give and how to be the recipient of what we're talking about this morning. And we're going to look at some wisdom from the Proverbs and what it says about it. And what we're talking about is how our God is an honest God. Now, I wasn't here last week when you talked about faithfulness, but Drew mentioned in the notes that uh, you guys talked about faithfulness. And, and he said that based on what you guys talked about with him being a faithful God, if he's faithful to his promise, if he... If he fulfills his word, he does what he says he's going to do, then by logical reason, we can then come to the determination that he's an honest God. My wife, Megan, if I tell you that she always delivers on her word, she always does what she says she's going to do, she always fulfills her promises, I would then say that Megan is an honest person. Back to God, though. So how do we... How do we back that up with scripture? What evidence is there for this? How do we build kingdom character in the department of honesty? And I want to tell you a story to start with this morning. This gentleman on the screen is Bobby Jones. And in night, really cool pants, by the way, right? <laughs> Wish that would come back in style. I almost pulled those out of the closet and wore them. But uh, in 1925, at the U.S. Open, he's on the 11th hole in the U.S. Open, a big tournament, and Bobby Jones is right there, neck and neck for the lead, 
and, uh, and he walks up to his ball and he moves a blade of grass. Didn't touch the ball, didn't move the ball, but touched a blade of grass and that ball moved. Now, if you know anything about golf, you know if your ball moves, that's a penalty. And so he, no one else saw it, went to the official and said, my ball moved. My ball moved, you need to assess a penalty against me. And they said, no, 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 you sure? Did you touch it? Did you move it? And he said, no, I, I touched the blade of grass and it moved, but the ball moved. He knew that it moved, and he was invoked the one-stroke penalty. Guess how many shots he lost the tournament by? <clears throat> one stroke. That one stroke. Now, after the match, he was praised for being such an honest person, and Bobby Jones said, well, then you might as well praise me for not robbing banks. What I'm getting at is that being honest isn't always easy. I can't imagine with a tournament on the line especially as big as that, as that one, that he goes through with that. So the first idea I want to look at is exactly that. Honesty often isn't easy. It's just not. Why? Okay. Yeah, sometimes you're, you're afraid of what's on the other side and how that other person is going to feel. Why, why else? Steve? Okay, it's easy to be dishonest. I, I think that that's, Steve, what, part of what I have and what I'm thinking, and I think we oftentimes think of it in regards to kids, but a little kid, if you'll remember being a little kid and it was time to be honest, then you got the one guy saying, Jed, tell the truth. Jed, be honest. And the other guy saying, run. You can get away with it. Lie. Lie all the way as far as you can. You, you got this, right? So, um, we, we do have that. It, it, we say it applies to kids, but it's us. It's us at work. It's us in the community. It's us in our marriages. It's us within ourselves, that part of honesty. Something else? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the complete opposite of what we see on the daily. And, uh, and we're going to talk about some of that, the world's view of, of honesty and how we need to change that. Now, sometimes <clears throat> it's funny that the hardest, well, it's not funny, it's very serious actually, that the hardest people to be honest with are those that I love the most. It's, uh, it's hard to be honest with my wife because I know how disappointed she's gonna be. It's hard to be honest with my parents. I know how disappointed they're gonna be in me. But we're also gonna talk about how Man, it's pretty easy sometimes to take someone I don't know and lay it on them, continue to lay it on them. And we got to be careful of that. We'll talk about some more of that as we go. But um, now on to Job. If you turn to Job 38 or not, you're just joining us. I'm going to read in just a minute from Job 38. We're all familiar with the story of Job. I think that one or two, just one or two bad things happened to him. And, uh, and he, he had a rough time there and, and some questionable friends. And we're not going to get all into that. Um, we talked a lot in our small group, I think that last class, about how Job and his faithfulness at the end of the book of Job was his deliverance. And he stayed faithful. But sometimes what we gloss over in this story, we forget about the pity party that he throws for himself, rightfully so. We would do the same. But it's a few chapters later, in chapter 38, we get this direct conversation from God to Job. And it's, it's not often in Scripture we get this, where we see him talking to someone. And so that's what we're going to read here. Chapter 38, 1 through 18. The Lord says, whoops, didn't mean to put that up there. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words? Without knowledge, brace yourself like a man. I'll question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you're the one that knows. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind uh, behind doors when it burst forth from the womb. When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, 
when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves hold. Verse 12, have you ever given orders to the morning? Or Job, have you ever shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? Have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me, Job, you the guy that knows all this? Now, I, I think that I would love to hear the audible version of how God said that. I wish I could match it. But I think it would be pretty cool to hear how intense. Because first off, you'll notice in that first verse that he comes out of a storm. Or some, some versions read that he comes out of a whirlwind. That alone, pretty intense and scary. But then on top of that, he gets into... Um, he gets into the fact that, okay, Job, you, you've had your turn. You've said all these things. Now it's my turn. And that's what we just read. He lays it on him pretty good. So let me ask you, it's, it's important to consider, I think, why God has this pointed conversation with Job. Is it because he's upset? Is it because he's angry or annoyed or frustrated let me lay it on you. What do you think? Why such a, a pointed, and I would say at times sometimes sarcastic, but yet brutally honest conversation with Job here? Very good. Yeah, it's not any of those things. Drew put in the notes, it's kind of an unfair question, what I just asked you. Because he's not annoyed. He's not angry. He's not upset. It is exactly that, to put him in his place. And we find out a few chapters later that really the reason why God said what he said was to produce his intended result with Job. That there was a motivation behind it to get this result out of Job. Now you ask, well, what is the result? And we see it in chapter 42, 4 through 6. I'm not going to read all that, but especially in verse 6, where he says, Therefore I despise myself and repent. What was the motivation? What was the reason why God was so brutally honest with Job here? There's a motivation to get him to repent. That was the reason, to get him to to change, to put him in his place. So let's talk about Jesus. And I want you to think on Jesus and his approach on getting an intended result. And if you think about the New Testament and how he handled people and how he talked to people, is Jesus ever pointed or direct in his speech to his followers? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Can you think of some examples where Jesus was very pointed and very direct and very brutally honest with the people that were listening to what he said? What would be one? Okay. Yep. What else? What else can you think of off the top of your head? Or can Okay, yeah, very pointed, very direct. Hey, listen up. Listen up. What I'm about to say is, is honest. What else? Yeah, very direct, almost to the point of, you know, lashing out. Right? Um, what else? Okay, yeah. Yeah, they're at the end of his, at the end of, uh, you know, his journey here on earth. Why, why can't you guys just stay awake? Why can't you just stay awake for just a little bit like I asked you to do and, and pray? Here's one that um, 
that Drew put here for us. And I, I found it interesting that this is very early in Jesus' ministry. Enter by the narrow gate. Like, I, I mean, you know, you, 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 you're trying to get people to follow you and you, you're telling them, hey, listen, the way through me, it's, it's small and it's tough and it's hard. You, you want to take that path to destruction, what does it say? It's easy. That way is wide. You want to take that route, that, that's, that's pretty easy. Now, I, I don't know how much more direct he can possibly be, but he's given us a, hey, for your information, what I'm giving you, what I'm telling you, it's actually hard. It's tough. I think we can find that <clears throat> uh, th that's pretty readily the foundational message of, of what we see all throughout Scripture, that, that our faith, our discipleship, is not easy. It's not easy to be a follower. And he wasn't going to pretend in talking to people that it was easy. You see here in Mark chapter 7, again, very early, uh, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many are going to say, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I went to church on Sunday. I put a check in the collection plate every time. I took the Lord's Supper. I did all these things. And he's going to say on that day, depart from me. I never knew you. But I want you to notice, it says many, many will say to me on that day. It can be a lot. That, that path that leads to destruction is wide. The path that leads to him, narrow. Here's another one, that, and I'm not, not going to talk too much on this one, but uh, Drew puts it in here that, you know, a similar message from Jesus to Nicodemus. I'm, I'm telling you how hard this is. You have to be born again in a new life to follow me. So let me ask you, are these words coming from Jesus, even centuries later, are they hard to hear? And why? Why are they so hard to hear for us? Or maybe even for them? I mean, I, can you imagine him saying that there's going to be many that will say to me on that day, I, I did all these things, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. I would sit there and say, is he talking about me? I'm talking about me, right? So why, why are these words so hard to hear? Okay, I heard... Um, it, it, it calls us to examine ourselves. And that's not, that's not comfortable. It's not fun sometimes to, to look in the mirror um, and, and really take a true evaluation of, of where you're at. And that's what he's asking them to do. Um, let, me, let me go a little deeper here. Thinking on Jesus and his approach to the people he was so honest with, in some of these examples, would you consider him to be harsh? Was it harsh to take the approach that he took in getting them and trying to get the intended result out of them? Would you say it was harsh? Okay, he could be harsh but not angry. Anybody else? Is it, is it harsh? Okay, firm, yeah. I, I, so I, I put it here, this reminds me so much of, of being a student once upon a time and now being in education and being a teacher and hearing kids say, man, that teacher's mean. Uh, he's just, he's brutal. I mean, just absolutely terrible to me. He's mean, he's harsh. But what that teacher, what they're reading between the lines now that I'm older and, and I know what that teacher is doing is they're honest and brutally honest to the point of getting that kid to succeed and they want them to do better and they want them to do better and they want them to do better and they want them to get to that intended result. Yeah, just a little bit. He, I, I would say, hold on a second, let me pull this down. He was pretty harsh about it. No. I'm kidding. 
No, but that, that's, that's what we're talking about here. I, I don't think that we could say that Jesus was harsh. He, he wanted these people to follow, to succeed, to do better. And so <clears throat> that result that, uh, you know, Jesus looking for that same result, that, that um, you know, that same result that we see from God to Job, repentance and then to, to follow him. He, he's telling us, you know, it, it's going to be hard. Not many people are going to choose my way. But his goal in telling us what he told us was to get to a greater reward. One of the stories that, that comes to mind here um, is that of the rich young ruler. If you'll turn there to Mark chapter 10, and I know, you know, we've read this a million times. But in this story of the rich young ruler, um, there's some brutal honesty here from, from Jesus. And, and I think it's, it's worth looking at. Mark chapter, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And he said, good teacher, he asked, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, give false testimony, you shall not defraud, and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, I've, I've done all that since I was a kid. Jesus looked at him and loved him, and he said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you'll have a treasure in heaven. <clears throat> then, come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich <clears throat> to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is. It's not easy. It's hard to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, for the most part, I'm going to insert some words. If this guy is not it, this rich, young, powerful ruler, if he's not it, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at him and said, with man, it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. You put yourself in their shoes and you've just witnessed this really awkward conversation and the guy that everyone around thinks is the man and the one that, you know, he's got a shot. He can be saved. And he leaves with his tail between his legs. Then they ask, who can be saved? But I, I think the key verse here is in verse 27. That this running theme in the New Testament that we can find is the truth of the difficulty of following Jesus and him being honest about that. But then at the same time, is it impossible? Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. Jed, it's hard. Joel, it's hard. But it's not impossible because we've got God. Let's look at a few more examples. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So just as he's direct about all the scary things and being pretty frank and, and blunt about it, he's also pretty direct about his desire and his motivation behind being honest and that intended result of being with us forever. Here's one you're probably thinking in your brain, John 3.16, but I don't want to read 3.16, I want to read 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. <clears throat> it wasn't to close off the narrow gate, but in order that the world might be saved through him, everyone, all people. Jesus' words were not, as we mentioned, not always delivered in such a way that it was nice it wasn't out there to attract uh, the rich and the famous. And it might have been a little uncomfortable at times, but it had behind it the right motivation to get the intended result. So now let's talk about us. 
How do we build on these kingdom characteristics or this kingdom characteristic? And the first part is don't let the world define how you view honesty. In regards to our honesty, the world's view on honesty, there's certain phrases. And when you see these, um, you know, that Drew put up here, you're, you're going to know what we're talking about here. The world's view of honesty. I'm just being honest. <laughs> so if I, if I tell Josh something and then I follow it up with, I'm just being honest, what do I really mean? What, what is my motivation behind that? What have I just said before I'm just being honest? Usually. What? Critical or rude or I've been mean and I've said something to Josh and then I follow it up with, but I'm just being honest. How about this one? I just tell it like it is. Man, we like these people, right? That just constantly tell it like it is and never know when to shut it off. It's, it's tough to hear. And I think that the, the world's view on, on honesty is this, that I just tell it like it is and I'm just being honest. And I don't care who it's directed at. We have to have, as God's people, we have to have higher expectations. So the motivation behind our honesty, why does it matter so much or does it? So if, I, if I'm going to be honest with someone, why does really, truly the motivation behind it matter the most with what we're talking about? Steve? Because God told us to. <clears throat> okay, because God told us to in regards to what? Okay. Anyone else? Absolutely. So Jesus says, love your neighbor as we do ourselves. I, I run up and I'm, I'm brutally honest with Mark here and I don't have the right motivation behind it. Have I, have I pushed him away through my honesty or have I brought him closer to being Christ-like? That's what we're talking about here. Yes. Okay, speak the... Okay, yeah, speak the truth in love. All right, Any, anyone else? Right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, and, and part of what we're not going to talk about that I've thought about is, is a lot of it comes through being that person all the time, well, right? The right, and, and always, well, I guess I did touch on it. I, I told you in the beginning, if my wife always delivers, and she always fulfills her promises, and she always does what she says she's going to do, and she's got that track record, then what are we going to say about her? She's honest, right? Um, that's, that's what we're going to say. That's who she is. That's a part of what makes her who she is. So I, I think we got to be careful, going back to my question here, that honesty can't be an excuse to hammer someone over the head with something that's semi-true or all the way true, but my intention behind it is completely wrong, and it's way off base. But I just tell it like it is. That's just what I do, right, Ernie? Yes. You're honest. Right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I won't. I won't. Would never. Um, the next part I want us to look at, you know, if, if we have to have a higher expectation in regards to honesty, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 26, I, I think is, is pretty cool in that it says, whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. I, I love this verse, and, and Drew gave me some notes here. This, this would be the kind of kiss that's not a romantic one. I'm sure you can figure that one out. Uh, but he puts in here that this happened in Exodus chapter 4, where Aaron kissed Moses. 
Ruth chapter 1 where Naomi kissed Ruth or where David kissed Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 20. Um, it, it's, it's unfamiliar to us, but it's the kind of, uh, kind of honesty to where it says to Steve, when I give him an honest word and I tell him something honestly and it has the right motivation behind it, that I'm telling him, Steve, I got your back. And I'm loyal to you, and I'm your friend, and I'm, 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 I'm showing you favor by telling you what I'm going to tell you because not only is what I'm saying honest, but it has the right motivation behind it. So why is our honesty, or why should our honesty always be like that? Why is that so important versus the opposite to be true? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Very good. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Steve? What about him? Yeah, let's... Yeah, well, I, I won't go there. I'll let you handle it with your kids how you see fit. Um, no, I, I, I just, I, I want you to know that, you know, being the kind of person that's honest and being honest in such a way that I have the right motivation is important to build that track record as we talked about and being honest with integrity but the part of, of keeping people on the right track, right? Of, of being that person for people. But what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes is also how to, how to be that person that can take an honest word and how to receive it. Um, we looked at a lot of the Proverbs recently in our small groups. Woman Wisdom talks about, uh, Lady Wisdom talks about some of this in Proverbs chapter 8, if, if you care to look at it. But our motivation in having higher motivation, or excuse me, yeah, having higher motivations um, cannot be that which you saw in those, those pictures that, that uh, we got in there, that I just tell it like it is, or I'm just being honest. It's got to be that which is uh, of, of saying, I got your back, and I'm being loyal, and I am your friend, and there's a good motivation behind it. Um, but again, we, we, our, our motivation behind our honesty has to be higher. If Jesus isn't willing to for anyone to be lost, and he tells us that, and he wants to spend eternity with everyone, then we've got to do a really good job when it's time to be honest with people. And we gotta be careful about what we're saying. Um, and yet, go ahead. Yeah, if you get going the wrong direction, it's hard to hard to cover them up. Yeah. Can our override our being honest because that's who we are? In other words, my intention has to be to save their soul, but you know what? If I'm honest, I might push them away. Yeah, I. I and you can't go there. Well, I think depending on depending on who you're talking to. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it, we don't always have the right things to say as far as what comes out verbally. But I know that if I go to my brother Bo and I say, because it's my brother and we have a good relationship, no matter if I get the words wrong, I'm assuming or I hope that Bo would know that my motivation is right for coming to him in the first place to give him something to think about. Could be the complete opposite. I don't know if this is where you're going, but could be the complete opposite with someone that I don't know. And I go to them and I mess up the words and they take it the complete other direction. But that's my point. That's why, I mean, we, we got to be careful with how it's delivered. If Christ wants all to be saved and our job is to be a part in that, we got to do a, a good job of, of what we say and how we say it. Mr. Sapp?
Can anybody catch it? No? Okay. We'll come back to it if you think of it. Yeah, raise it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, our, our, our honesty comes out like this and just is a, is a constant drip. And, and maybe this is you, maybe it's not. Maybe you're the quiet type and, and it's, it's not you. But I think for a lot of people, dishing out honesty is pretty easy. And so it's just a constant drip on someone when it's the same person. And it's steady rolling and steady coming at you. Now, if you're on the receiving end of someone that's constantly dumping and dripping and doesn't have the shut it off, how does that feel and how do we react? Feels good, right? <laughs> no, it's just a constant beat down, which I talked about already. You know, you, you think about Jesus, and um, although he was brutally honest, was he constantly raining down upon everyone willing to listen without the right things to say? Did he ever say what he said and then just say, well, I'm, I'm just being honest. And I, I just, I'm just telling it like it is. No. His motivation was higher than that, and ours needs to be as well. I, this is a good example here. If you've been reading the Proverbs, you're, you're about, I guess, would be on the seventh time reading these uh, this year. But a good, good example here in Proverbs of, of some restraint on that honesty that, that uh, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Wise and gracious people know when to shut it off as well as when to speak it who to speak it to, and how to deliver it. Um, going back to the faucet, they, they know when to shut it down and shut it off. Um, as I said, not even Jesus addressed everyone's flaws all at one time. He, he didn't dump on them like that. And I, I can't help but, but think of, you know, Mr. Walden just, just talked about, uh, you know, an, an honest truth of, of me calling him short and fat. Well, this goes back to, my wife Megan walks out of the room and we're getting ready to go on a date and she says, how do I look? And I say, well, honey, man, you're, you're getting a little chunky and your makeup's pretty jacked up. Where, you know, what's, what's up with your hair? Now, I, I would never, I would never. And yet that's, that's, I mean, she would literally punch me. She, she punches pretty good. So, um, but no, that, that doesn't go over well, but that's what we're talking about. The constant drip of, of not being able to shut it down and shut it off and, and knowing who we're, who we're talking to. Proverbs 15, 23, a, another example uh, to make an apt answer is, is a joy to a man. Here's another one um, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. I think that this verse is another value, uh, valuable uh, guide in, in our relaying of, of being honest. Uh, people can see straight through our intentions and our motivation behind whatever it is. If it's shallow, then they're going to see through that. Um, yeah. Yep. And I've thought about that for 20 years. You know, I, I think um, that full of hurt. You don't want someone all you want to mistake for naked, but when you do it, you figure it out. Very good. And I think that we can all think of a time where someone pulled us to the side and said the right thing versus pulling us to the side and saying the wrong thing. 
and how that differs with what we're talking about. You, you, look at, um, you look at what's said here. What are the good motivating words on the screen that we need to take and use as motivators behind us being honest? Okay, encourage would be one. What else? Patience. Requires a lot of patience. What else? Help. I mean, th those are all... Those are all words that we can use when going to someone in honesty, um, uh, you know, to use as, as motivation. But I, I need you to know that this is not just about how to dish it out, because the flip side of that is we got to know how to receive it. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, but oftentimes this is the part that we're the worst at. And, and I think that Drew could probably spend another class talking about how to receive an honest word. Um, you ever had a friend tell you something that was hard to hear, and, and Bo just kind of talked about one, and I want you to think on that example and how you reacted to that. You see, more times than not, we don't walk away like Bo saying, man, that was, that was weird, <laughs> and yet that was good. Usually we walk away and we're upset, and we're frustrated that that person came to us and told us something that was absolutely true. I think Proverbs talks about this in 27 and verse 6, that faithful are the wounds of a friend. I've not had many wounds that I thought were good, but these are the good kind of wounds. Because the wounds that it's talking about here in Proverbs is that of reproof and correction, that when I veer off the path, when I get away from God's word, when I do those things that are wrong and Joel comes to me and gets me back in line, that's a good kind of wound. But I got to be willing to take on that wound in order for him to save my life. Our reaction needs to be that which we're able to take it. Drew put this quote in here. I like it. Uh, Greg Morse writes that true friends are not mobsters who club us with their words to prove points or settle scores, but godly friends are not less than EMTs who will rip open our carefully crafted excuses and stun us back to life. They wound us for our good. We need to be the kind of people who are willing to wound our friends for their good, and we need to be people who accept the wounding of a friend. Now again, if you've been reading Proverbs, you've read this one several times. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. In a literal sense, what does it look like when iron sharpens iron? Is it a pretty picture? Jim? Okay, the wise take rebuke to heart. So b back to iron sharpening iron. What does that look like? Sparks are flying, it's hot. Um, it, it makes a, a really like kind of terrible nails on the chalkboard-ish noise. Like we, do, we don't like that noise, we don't care for it. And I, I think that what we can learn here is that as iron sharpens iron and I sharpen someone else or they sharpen me, it does, it's not, there, there's no promise of, of, uh, of it being just beautiful and, and, and rainbows and peachy and, and we're all just good and happy after someone is honest with me. But sometimes it's messy and sparks fly and it can get all out of sorts. But if you go back to Paul's words about encouraging and helping and being patient, what you have in the end is the intended result of that iron sharpening iron. That that blade is going to do at the end of it that blade is going to be sharp, it's going to be good, and so will that relationship should we approach it that way. Steve? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. 
Well, I, I think in, in regards to being on the receiving end, be, I, I told you I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, I'm also a coach. There is nothing worse than a kid that doesn't want his tools sharpened by way of an education or out on the field. And I, I, I think that I can give him something, but he just doesn't want it. There's nothing worse. And we know people like that, that we go, we're ready to, to intervene on their behalf and they just don't want it. That's, that's tough to take. As we close here, we need to make sure that we surround ourselves with iron, that we're doing just that. On the flip side, you can not surround yourself with iron and, and be corrupted. I'm going pretty fast here. Proverbs 27 and verse 9. In closing, oil and perfume make the heart glad and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Uh, Drew put in here something about it, it taking a village to raise a child. And we, and we know that proverb. And we're not talking about children necessarily. Um, but I know that to be true, that it takes a village to raise a child having young kids. I mean, it, it truly takes a lot of people to raise up that child. But I want to leave you with something this morning as you leave, that we need to choose the right village. We need to choose the kind of people that we're going to be around that will sharpen us and us be able to sharpen them. We need to be around the kind of people that are honest, as Jesus was honest with the rich young ruler. We need to be around those kind of people. Find the iron in your life that will keep you sharp and find the people that you can keep sharp as well when you're ready to be honest and intervene and have the right motivation behind it. We are fresh out of time. Wish I could take the last few comments, but can't. Thank you guys for your attention.